All right, let's jump into uh, the value proposition presentation. So um, first and foremost, why I'm up here, who am I? So I went through the PSL program last, uh, last year. Glad to see that the program has grown to such an extent. That's exciting, that's encouraging. And congratulations on being accepted into the accelerator program. So I am the uh, founder and a current member of two different businesses right now, both a services-based business and a product-based business. Service-based business is on the left here. That's the next step. We offer product strategy consulting. What we say we do is for those that are building product businesses, we help them find their market. But on the other side, the Staff Geek logo is our product-based business. Staff Geek is a personality-based hiring assessment platform. So if you've ever heard of like Myers-Briggs or something like that, we use a version of that, kind of a, a super enhanced version of that to help companies and candidates find the right fit. Uh, so before I move on, the question I have is, is anyone working on a business currently that is exclusively services based, where you don't have some form of product or app or technology involved? Does everyone have a product business for the most part? Okay, good. Uh, so I'm gonna pull from examples from both of these. I've got two options. Most of it is on the product based business side because I figured that would be the case. But if you want another uh, perspective, let me know. All right, so where where a lot of this terminology is going to come from, and the school of thought that I pull from frequently, is this uh, lean startup school, lean startup, uh, and uh, lean product development programs. Is anybody not familiar with lean? Okay, good. So uh, this is a book I'd highly recommend. There's a number of versions of it out there. My contact information is going to be towards the end of the presentation. Shoot me an email if you haven't. If you don't have a copy of this or haven't read it, uh, Ash is a friend, so I have a copy for everyone from some of those resources, they're valuable. So in the lean school, in the lean startup process essentially, there's various stages that you're looking for to achieve as you're making progress building your product-based business. The first two are probably what you've more commonly heard of, and those are both problem solution fit being the first phase, the second phase being product market fit, and you may have heard that more frequently. That one gets passed around a lot. The third scaling, I would roll into uh, the second step. Pro uh, finding product market fit is essentially all about scaling. So what do these two mean? So problem solution fit is all about how do you identify a problem that's large enough for a large enough number of people to the extent where a solution is warranted. We're looking for a way to solve that problem. The solution component to that is how do you, you solve it in a way comprehensively enough to the extent where those that have that problem are willing to try a different way to solve it. And they're willing to use not just what you've developed, but pay for it as well. So you have proof of concept there, right? Because you're building it into a business. Product market fit, on the other hand, after you've identified problem solution fit, product market fit is all about scaling. Are we all familiar with the hockey stick level of growth that we're all looking for? That's what you're on your way to when it comes to product market fit. So problem solution fit, think uh, qualitatively, Product market fit, think quantitatively. Okay, so uh, Jacqueline talked a bit about the Lean Canvas, so I believe she even handed out versions of it for you. What is it? Uh, anybody not heard of Lean Canvas before? No worries, it's a safe space, so you can put my hands up. No, <laughs> I'm good. So Lean Canvas essentially is your product. When I ask the question doing the product consulting work that I do, right, what is your product? Describe it for me. That's what the blue box in this picture essentially is. That's the answer I most commonly get, is all I get is features or the solution, right? But there's so much more to it. In Canvas does a good job of comprehensively asking any, answering any other question that someone might have about your product. That's essentially what it is. So if we go into a little more detail there, can you guys read this? Is that big enough? Okay. So nine boxes on your in Canvas and they're in what seems to be somewhat of a random order. I'll explain what that's all about. Today we're gonna to talk mainly about one, two, and three. So that's your problems, customer segments, and unique value proposition. What those are, the problem box, that is the top problems that your product solves. Customer segments, moving on to number two, these are your target customers. Who you think, who you are going to to uncover these problems. Number three, your unique value proposition. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail with that yet because that's the focus of the presentation, so we're going to go into it later. Number three, oh, I'm sorry, number four, your solution box. These are your, the way that you're going to solve those problems. 
So if your solution, your top solutions are essentially going to translate into the features for your product. Number five, your unfair advantage. What, what essentially, make, what differentiates you to the extent where it's not easy to find the solution somewhere else? What's defensible about your product? That's what you can think of when you're thinking about unfair advantage. Uh, revenue and cost structure, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. How does your product make money? What does it cost to offer your product to people? Eight and nine, eight is key metrics. Think of this, this area as your ROI. People are using your product for a reason. They're intending to get value out of it. How can you prove to them, or how can you measure for them how much value they're getting, right? What, what is important to measure? Number nine, channels. This is about finding additional customers. As you are identifying your target customers, channels is gonna be a path to finding even more of areas. How many people have seen this quote before, or heard some version of it? What does it mean? This is collaborative too, so if you guys have questions, just shout it out. All right, so I saw a hand, so someone has to say something. Fair enough. I saw a lot of hands at this table. I want somebody. Let's see what you got. First, you need to be enlightening the actual research process. If you have one solution in mind, who's going to try to describe it? So if you couldn't couldn't hear him, essentially, what if I'm paraphrasing correctly, alluding to bypassing some form of a research process. Is that fair? And I would agree, right? I think this quote, relatively famous quote, does a good job of communicating some of the wrong approaches to take when you're building a product-based business, right? This essentially is saying to me that if I start with my product or if I start with my solution, I'm going to just seem to find problems I was seem to find problems to use it to solve everywhere, but that may not necessarily be the case. So we want to think about that in, from a different perspective, and I'll describe a little bit more what that means. I don't know who this guy is, but I'll write down everything he says. <coughs> this is brilliant. So simple and elegant. So what I say when I'm working with people in the product-based businesses is it's not product market fit, it's market product fit. You don't want to think of the product first. You want to think of your market first. I'm going to describe a little bit more what that means, but essentially don't start with the answers. Find the problems first. You start with the answers, you're going to make a lot of preconceived notions that you may end up finding out are wrong. So you want to break that, break that mold, essentially. Okay, so this is a different way to kind of organize and break down the lean canvas, if you will. Grouping them into different categories. So remember I was saying it's market product fit as opposed to product market fit. So that's why we start with market here, um, fair enough. So uh, these are the nine boxes in the table itself, grouped into different categories. So we've got market, idea, product, why. Market components where you're doing your research, ultimately to find out, again, what are the extent of the problems in the market in which we're looking for them. Idea then from that research is you're forming your product idea, right? We have identified a number of problems, Clearly a solution is warranted. What is that solution going to be? That's where the idea phase comes into play. So those three components from the Lean Canvas fall well into that category. And then it's not until after we've accomplished both of those things do we have enough market research, do we essentially have a solid product idea and we've tested it, so we really should be thinking about developing and executing our product. By the time you get to the product phase, it should be relatively straightforward what you're building and more importantly why you're building that. Why is that? So, from I can speak from experience, unfortunately, but failed startups, or nine out of 10 products fail. Why is that? They run out of resources. What resources? Time or money. So it's a race to essentially get yourself as close to product market fit as you can before you run out of either one of those two things. Where do we have the most variables? It's in the product phase. It's in engineering, it's in development. It's very time consuming. It's very expensive, often oftentimes, depending on how you go about it. So the more you know about the process and the more solid you are with your plan, as in I know my market well, I have a solid idea and I've tested it, the less surprises you're gonna have in the product phase. That's why this process. But a different way to think about it, again, we're gonna look more at problem segments and unique value proposition. All right, so this is all great, but where do I get it from? Where do I get the answers? And the, the short answer is there's no substitute for talking to people. There's no substitute for market research. On the earlier side of your products, 
you should be talking to everyone until you essentially can identify a pattern for which the product that you're working on starts to resonate with a particular segment. As you start to identify those patterns, you can get more specific. Look to talk to more people that are like the individuals for which your product is resonating with, but continue to talk to people. This holds true for the entire product business. There never should be a point where you stop talking to people about your product. Because that's ultimately where a lot of your innovation is going to come from. Capture their feedback in their own words is important. What we say a lot is understand your customer voice. Right? If you can articulate for anyone what the voice of your customer is, you understand it adequately enough, that's a good check. Because you should have spoken to enough people that to one, once you're at that level, it should be almost memory burden in your head. Right? Prospective customers are saying this when they say yes. Prospective customers are saying this when they say no. Existing customers are saying this, right? Most frequently. Okay, so what questions do we ask and to whom? So I've got two questions up here, two options. If I have to choose between one of these two questions, which one do I ask? Second one. Why number two? Open-ended question, right? Try to use the microphone so everybody can hear. Oh, that's right. Just because it would be helpful. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, the acoustics in here are interesting. <laughs> Colleen, wherever she is, had mentioned to me, you make sure you use the microphone because no one will be able to hear you if you don't. <laughs> then I walked over there and I couldn't hear anything. So <laughs> it's good to have great people on that. So number two, you said, because it's an open-ended question. Yes, and I agree, right? What are, your poss what are the possible answers to question number one if I ask that? Yes or no? I can guess right now with a 50% probability what the answer to number one is without it before I even ask it. How much information does that tell me, right? Now what about number two? What are the possible answers I'm gonna get for number two? I have no idea, right? But that's the point, right? I wanna to get to the raw data in the customer's own voice. I wanna hear exactly what they say. And I don't wanna frame it in any context. The more we get it in the raw format, right? It's our idea, it's, it's our job to get the information from them. And then when we get the information from them, we can form it into certain patterns, right? But we, we want to hear it in the raw format. We want to hear it in their voice, right? Capture the customer's voice. Okay, so when talking to people about your product and your product idea, have some form of structure to it, right? The more structure we have with it, the more valuable that data is going to be. This is also from that running lean book. It's a relative script to follow when you're talking to customers. And uh, we don't need to go into a ton of detail here. Again, I'm gonna send you guys a copy of that if you're looking for it. But if you can't see it, the most valuable and biggest pieces of this are one of the boxes in here, which is exploring the customer's worldview. That's what you're trying to capture. You're trying to understand the customer's worldview. You wanna understand, you wanna know them almost better than they know themselves, right? Once you can identify patterns and what customers are gonna say, once you start predicting what they're going to be able to say, you know it at an expert level. And it's gonna come in very handy. Another thing to remember when you're talking to prospective customers, existing customers, learning more about your product, it took you a certain amount of effort to get in front of that individual, right? Chances are, a lot of people, most people hang out with people that they have something in common with. Chances are, the person you're talking to may know someone else that is worthwhile for you to speak with. So as you're talking to one person, before you wrap up, ask them, is there anyone else that you know that may be interested in what we're working on here? And would it be all right if I spoke with them? Ask for a word of introduction, right? One leads to two, leads to three. Just an easier way for you to find more people to talk to about what you're doing. Okay, so getting out of the theory, getting more into the practice element of what we're gonna be talking about today, I'm gonna to share with you some examples for uh, my product business, Dev Geek, which again is a hiring assessment platform. And these are essentially some of the results and quotes that I've been getting from people I've been speaking to about that product. Uh, this is one. We're going to talk about how this translates to both the problem box and the customer segment box, right? If we think about segments, clearly at the bottom here we've got Jim on, so that's one particular market vertical. And here's their quote, right? All the candidates we talk to don't want to work the way that we do. From their own from their own voice, it's an actual quote. Second one, frustrated accounting partner, right? Another customer segment that we can identify and look for more of. From their words, we invest in new hires for up to six months, then they leave for a bigger firm. Between these two quotes, if I had to summarize, 
I would say both of these individuals are frustrated by not being able to find candidates that are the right fit. Right? That's, to me, what they both have in common. They both feel that their environment, their companies are unique and they're right, and the people that they're trying, the processes that they're following are not working. Right? So I'm finding, I'm finding my problem, but I'm drawing correlation between the data that I'm getting from multiple sources. Okay, so this is a quote that I see everywhere, and it's, in my opinion, always misinterpreted, so that's frustrating. Has anybody not seen this or heard this before? Which I believe is loosely affiliated with Henry Ford. I couldn't find any actual evidence that he ever actually said this. That's why the question mark. <laughs> but anyway, so someone else give me an idea. Like, what, what does this quote mean to you? How, how, do you, how do you interpret this? We'll try with the microphone this time. The way I always saw it was more of, you went over and asked somebody what product they wanted. They would look at what products they currently are using and say, I want a better version of this, or more of it, like in one simple product. They wouldn't look for the next revolution or the next thing they could actually change. And a new product that you're actually being out. Thank you. And agreed, right? So how I would paraphrase how most people have interpreted this, whatever this is, what lifestyle, is that People don't know what they want. I have to tell them what they want. You've heard that from a number of famous figures throughout history. Looking at you, Apple. Steve Jobs. <laughs> but to me, this, there's a whole different context here, right? If this is actually what people are saying, there's something very important to me here that speaks to something we can do. In particular, what supposedly were people saying about the new horse that they wanted? faster, right? They didn't say they wanted a bigger horse. They didn't say they wanted a safer horse. They wanted a faster horse. To me, that is what, that's the only word that matters here of everything that's up here. They wanted to move from point A to point B in a shorter period of time. That's a problem, right? And if this is the quote that he extracted from all the conversations with customers and he identified a pattern, right? So this doesn't mean people don't know what they want. This means people can't envision the innovative solution to the problem they have or what they want solved. Right? And that's what we do. That's what the entrepreneur does. That's what the innovator does. That's our job. So this the information is valuable. It's the taken in the wrong context more often than not. And to make a faster horse, it could have invented anything. It didn't have to be the automobile. It could have been a motorcycle. It could have been a boat, plane, whatever. Faster method of transportation that just happened to satisfy this problem. All right, so getting into uh, specifically what we're talking about today in your unique value proposition. This is the definition of it, taken from, taken out of the lean context. And there's three things in particular to look out for here uh, from the definition. In particular, it's a single message, which is important. You have a limited window in which to capture people's attention, so keep it consistent. Number two is why you're different. So how is your product differentiated? Essentially meaning, why am I buying your product and not someone else's? And then uh, it's worth buying, right? How am I gonna get value out of whatever it is that you're trying to sell me, or whatever your product ultimately is. Your value proposition should touch on all three of these components. It's important that it does. The reason why I asked you to fill out the index part in the beginning is so we capture whatever context your value proposition is now, so you can grade it against the exercises we're going to go through. Okay, this is important, right? Because in communicating your value proposition, right, you can hit on all those things, but you can drone on and on and on, and you can talk forever. Simpler is always going to be better. If however your value proposition is, is created today, if it's reading at like an eighth or ninth grade level, you're way too optimistic. I'm thinking fifth grade level tops, right? You cannot oversimplify it. It might sound borderline condescending, but that's a good thing, right? You don't want to lose anyone in conversation, especially when you begin it. Why? Because you can't unmelt someone's brain. I've been there, and I'm going to describe a little bit more about what I mean by that. Uh, I'm actually going to pull for my arts and crafts activity over here, so if I get one of these to stick. Okay, so I got the title up here as wordsmithing, and these are from both. So the top level is my is a component of my product-based business step. The bottom one is from my service-based business next step but uh, it's consistent. So 
Now on the top here, I don't know if you can see, but uh, the first word that I have down here for the Staff Geek example is psychometric. Show of hands, how many people know what psychometric is? I don't, so I'm gonna keep my hand down. And if you raise your hand, I'm gonna make you defend yourself. Okay, go down and see hands. How many people have heard of, seen, or think they can at least in some way, shape, or form describe personality? Okay, I literally had no hands up before, and then almost everyone, I hope, raised their hand. One word difference. Psychometric used to be in my value proposition for staff geek. Guess why I got rid of it? No one had any idea what I was talking about, including myself. Big difference. Second example. This is for my product strategy services business next up. Uh, the first one says product management. This is what I used to describe what I did before. We offer product management services. And the kind of response I would get is, oh, that's interesting. Tell me what type of project management services you offer. Anybody pick up on the difference? I didn't say project management. I said product management. So when I would take the next step and then try to correct them, I'd say, well, actually, we don't do project management. We do product management. And it's a little different. It's kind of like project management because it's like you're managing a project, but it's really a product. And at this point, they either fall asleep or walked away, or I've lost them completely, and I'm not getting them back. So I melted their brain, trying to uh, digging myself deeper into that hole. Because when I said product management, they focused on the word management. And then they associate management with the most common phrase that they hear, which is project management. Right? So that's not on them, that's on me. But again, that's a piece of information that I picked up and learned, therefore I needed to make an adjustment. What adjustment did I make? I stopped saying pro product management, I can't even say it myself. Now I say product strategy. Right? So now when I say we offer product strategy services, what people say back to me, oh, that's interesting. What type of products do you work with? Right? I move the conversation forward. And that's what matters. I've got them engaged, and I'm, I've got them heading in the direction I want them to be. Instead of taking a step back and having to try to dig myself out of a hole, it really didn't work very well. Now the conversation is moving forward, right? Because when I say product strategy, they see strategy, a word they're familiar with, but they've heard a lot, much like personality. They don't focus on strategy, they focus on product. And that's what I want them to focus on. I want them to ask me questions about product. That way I can describe how I help in that area. So this is just an exercise you know, on avoiding as much as you can melting people's brains. I have a lot of experience in it, so if you think you are, let me know. <laughs> you can test that out on my brain. Right. So get comfortable living here. Build, measure, learn, pattern, right? We make assumptions, we run tests, but that's where we want to live. That is why you've decided to do what you're doing. Not everything's going to work. Some days it's going to be two steps forward, one step back. Some days it's going to be one step forward, two steps back. But if you have the former more than you have the latter, you're going to be making progress. If you get comfortable in this space, you're going to be invaluable to yourselves and your product businesses. So essentially what this means is just always be testing. Testing and learning and getting better. Everything that we're doing is going to evolve. Much like I have over there, trying to wordsmith. And I'm an engineer, so I'm terrible at that. All right, so on to some actual examples. So this is my value proposition for Staff Geek. All right, let's take a closer look. Staff Geek creates a custom personality-based assessment for each company we work with, so it's easy to tell which candidates are the right fit. That is Staff Geek's value proposition. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to compare this essentially to both the definition, to what my customers are saying, and I want to describe my product to an extent, right? So remember back from our definition, and I put, I kind of hung these up on the wall, I don't know if you guys can see them, but they're hanging out up here. Unique value proposition and three things that I identified that's important to have is a single thought, right? This is literally a single sentence, so for the most part, it's a single thought. It's a probably a little long, I could probably cut it down a little bit, but regardless, it's a single thought. Um, how are we differentiated, number two, Right, why, why, buy our, why buy our product instead of another product on the market? Now, I don't know how, how much you guys know or don't know about hiring assessments, but there's a ton of them out there. Uh, it is a relatively crowded marketplace, and there's some that have been out there for decades. What's unique about what we do is this aspect up here, and that's custom, the word in the top right. Almost every other assessment platform on the market, as far as I know, 
is not custom to each company that we work with. Every other one is one size fits all. And our justification there is two companies, two different companies, everything else remaining the same. Industry, type of work you do, size, geography, success at each one of those companies can be very different. You can have completely different cultures. So how could one assessment work for both? To us, there's different things that are gonna make you successful in one environment than it may in another. And that messaging resonates really strongly with the, the companies that we speak with. So we got differentiated, and then we want to differentiate it and why we're worth buying, right? Uh, worth buying is because, again, right, if we, and this is gonna roll into me comparing this to what my customers are saying, remember back to those quotes that I showed you? Frustrated gym owner, frustrated accounting partner. What they articulated to us was that they're struggling to find candidates that are the right fit. Bottom two sentences here. So it's easy to tell which candidates are the right fit. That both demonstrates why we're worth buying and it speaks directly to what our customers are saying. So we can check that box as well. So we've got a uh, definition of our value proposition. Um, <coughs> definition of, oh, across. Definition of our value proposition. We've got addressing the concerns of our customers and their worldview. And then also, we're looking to describe our product to an extent. So how does this describe what our product is? We're a personality-based assessment platform. It's literally right there, right? So if I can get these words out in conversation, I have described a lot for someone that I want to talk to, right? Do your best for your value proposition and check those boxes, right? And what you wrote down on those index cards, compare them against, not this, but this, right? Try to check all three of these boxes with your value proposition. And again, one of the keys is single statement, right? Not, not necessarily a single statement, it doesn't have to be a single sentence, single thought, right? Keep the thought process straightforward and simple. Also, no large words. If, don't use a word with three syllables if one with two won't do. Don't use three sentences if two won't do, right? You cannot oversimplify this process, I promise you. And the simpler it's going to be, you can always go from simpler to more complicated. Good luck trying to get people re-engaged after you've already lost them. Right? Think about my wordsmithing exercise. Today. So start simple and then you can go more detailed from that based on their reactions, their questions, right? When I switched product management out to product strategy, once I got questions about what products do you work with, outstanding. Now we can start talking about what I actually do. I can speak to some examples. <laughs> okay, so how do we grade our value proposition? How well is it working? Your goal, well, let's go this way. Based on what I'm going to say about my company and communicating my value proposition or my pitch or whatever, I could have any number of reactions. I could get one reaction to my value proposition, which is up here somewhere, so that's also still right there. But the reaction I could get is custom assessment for every company you work with. How is that possible? How do you do that? I, I don't believe it. I could get that reaction, right, skepticism. I can get a different reaction, which I do, I get both. The other one can be personality assessment platform. I've heard about these, that's interesting. Tell me more about how it works. If I get either one of those, positive or negative, I've got them. They're hooked and they're engaged. I don't care whether or not you don't believe me or whether or not you do believe me. I just want you to give me the opportunity to talk more about my problems. I want you to be engaged in the conversation. So what are you looking to avoid? What you're looking to avoid is this response. Hmm, that's neat. So what'd you do this weekend? You lost them forever. Good luck getting them back, right? Because they moved on. Whatever you said wasn't interesting enough to them, right? And in the beginning, when we're talking to everyone, it's not necessarily gonna resonate with everyone, and it doesn't have to, right? Ultimately, you're gonna find your segment for which your value proposition resonates. Lawyers, accountants, most people in traditional professional services, uh, companies and offering those types of services, for me, it just doesn't resonate. Right? I, can, I can make a certain amount of progress, but again, they're not my target market. They don't really make a great referral partner for me necessarily because they're not close to what I do. Uh, so it's important though to, ins to ensure that you're getting some form of a reaction. Right? Go for a reaction. Don't be afraid to be bold. Right? Say, something, say something wild. Right? Uh, we're gonna get into more of an example of that as well, too. So, after we get through our grading, right, how do we make it stick? We want them to remember what we're communicating to them. If you connect your value proposition to your mission, 
that's really what people are going to remember. People love a good story. They want you to tell it to them in story format, right? Think about the boring stories that you've read relative to your favorite stories, right? Something about that story resonated with you and enabled you to remember it. Your mission statement is your why. Why are you doing what you, why are you here right now? Right? Everyone's here past business hours for a reason. One or another here. No one's requiring you to be here, except maybe Jacko. She's very effective. But seriously, your passion, your why, that is going to resonate with people. So if you can describe that for people, it sticks with them. And it should connect to your value proposition. So I think I've got mine up here somewhere. Uh, might be my last remaining sheet. Uh, I believe it's called sticky pitch. That's why it's labeled this way. 
there's five questions on here. It's another way to think about your value problem. So uh, number one is, and if you answer these questions, these, these will help you. If you're stuck anywhere with your value proposition, go through this exercise as well. This may help get you unstuck. Number one, who is the product or service for? Right? That's your target market, essentially. Number two, what are they unhappy with? So essentially, what are the problems that they're experiencing? Number three, broad overview. That's basically your, uh, your value proposition. What is it unlike? How are you differentiated? Right? And the unfair advantage is also on the, uh, the lead counts. Uh, these are a couple of my favorite books that you may want to take a closer look at for what you're doing. Running Lean, that I mentioned previously, and again, shoot me an email if you want a copy of that. In the middle is Gabriel Weinberg's book, The Founder of DuckDuckGo. The title of that book is Traction. Why I like this book so much is, and you guys are going to be working on this with Jacqueline throughout the program with your uh, one metric that matters, but Gabriel Weinberg's perspective, he gives a bunch of examples as far as how to get traction with your product business. Figuring out which one of those works for you is critical. And one other perspective that I like a lot, and it plays in well with my right market idea product, market product fit instead of product market fit, is that in the beginning, you should be selling upwards of 50% of everything that you're doing. If you're working on anything else and you're selling or talking to people or interviewing customers less than half of your time, you're not doing enough of it. Now, we're product guys, so we're relatively biased, but still, you're always going to be learning things if you're talking to people at that level of frequency. And then the last one is called Ask, and that gets into a little bit more about how you can ultimately build the right type of surveys, the right questions to ask when you're talking to customers and getting the information that you're looking for, right in a timely and efficient manner, so that you're not dominating people's time. And then reach out when you need help with support, right? PSL is a fantastic community. If you're not on the Slack channel, you should be. There's a lot of great dialogue there. There's a ton of people that are very supportive in the Philly startup community and environment. So reach out, ask for help. This is my email. Shoot me a note and for everyone that's a member of the PSL Accelerator Program, uh, offering a free product discovery session for you guys. So if you want to spend an hour or two, my office, yours, whatever, let me know and we can dive in specifically to some of your product problems in addition to the Q&A that we're, uh, hope I'm guessing we can kind of roll to at this point. Yeah, so um, why don't we take a five minute break? Sure. Just so you can have it, grab food, grab food, the restroom and just quickly five minutes and then we'll, we'll get back to the second half. I will let Sean facilitate his own Q&A, but uh, don't be shy. Any questions related to his presentation, please, uh, please go ahead and do that, There are some signs of when you reach the product market. What are some signs <laughs> of when you have reached the product market? That's enough. A great question. What I what I particularly market product. Catboy. Thank you, by the way. Where'd you get that quote? <laughs> <laughs> so, in particular, what I the challenge with that answering that question is when people answer it this way, and you may have heard that before, is well, you'll know when you're a product market fit when you're there. It's like okay, great, thanks. But if I'm not there, how do I know where I'm at and if I'm getting closer, right? So there's a couple of really interesting ways that I've seen in, in order to kind of measure how close you are to product market fit. I'll start with problem solution fit. So to me, how I measure whether or not you're problem solution fit, because I think there's more variability in getting a problem solution fit than there is in getting a product market fit. To me, scaling is all about it's a race, right? How many people can you get this product in front of and how much market saturation can you reach before you plateau? To me, problem solution fit, what I ask in order to figure out whether or not I feel that they're there is, again, is voice of the customer based. So I ask one of two questions. What is the voice of the customer for the paying customers you currently have? What do they say about your product? If I get five different variations of that, you're not a problem solution. I'm looking for one. If I ask for your prospective customers for what you're trying to sell your product to, what do they say about your product when they say yes, and what do they say about your product when they say no, and again, I get almost like an open-ended answer, just throw it on and on and on and on. Again, I feel you're not a problem solution fit. When you're finally there, it will be painfully obvious to you. 
as far as what your customers are saying on both ends of the, that spectrum. Now you're going to need a certain amount of data, you're going to need a certain amount of customers, you're going to need a certain amount of usage of your product in order to get there, but it's going to be like bullet points on a slide. It's not going to be, well, that depends, it depends if they're this or they're that. You're, you, don't, you just don't have enough data. So that's probably a solution fit. Product market fit on the other hand, right? We talked about the hockey stick level growth. Um, so I'm going to try to actually take advantage of my whiteboard here. Whiteboard in the room, I have to use it. It's my contract. So, over time, and I'm just going to call this traction, right? Because your y axis here can be traction for you, may be different, right? You may be looking for revenue, you may be looking for users, whatever it is, but the, the growth pattern that you're looking to achieve, that's where your so called hockey stick level growth comes from. When your growth starts to become exponential, however, you're measuring traction you're well on your way to product market fit, right? Why it's difficult to answer this question for some people is because your traction variable may be different, right? You may have a freebie model. However, your, your product is, your revenue model, all these different things can be different. So traction for you may be a different metric, may be a different variable. But whatever it is that you're measuring, like say you're, you've, achieved, you've achieved problem solution fit when you're kind of on this path. You have something to measure and you're continuing to make progress. But you're at product market fit when you have more than enough starting to grow exponentially relative to what you're measuring. And what you're measuring should drive you closer to the goals of both your product, which should be connected to the goals of your business, right? Um, there's actually a really interesting article that I read recently from the first round guys, where we had our party and you read that. Okay, that, I like that a lot. I don't know if anyone else hasn't read that yet, I'll share that out. But for someone who has a successful product-based business, they essentially came up with a system of how to measure how close they are to product market fit based on surveying their serving their users, serving their customers. The way that process worked was asked a number of questions. In particular, the way that they tried to measure it was the question that they were ultimately asking for which the answer would matter most and how they were going to reverse engineer it and measure it was. If you lost access to our product today or tomorrow, how would you feel about it? And the answers were increasing levels of severity, ranging from like, I don't care, to indifference to, this would like actually disrupt the way that I'm doing my work. And this would disrupt my day-to-day -day process. And the more people that fell into that category, they set a threshold where if a number of your customers are at or above a certain threshold for that answer, then you're at product market fit. It was a really interesting article I'll share with you guys. A lot of interesting detail in there, and a cool way to think about it. Does that give you the point? Can I ask you? Yeah, go for it. Do you hear me? Okay, yep. Uh, Staff Geek seems like a really cool idea. Can you talk about how you launched the company in terms of what vertical you went after? I mean, that, that you had a huge window. All right, we want every company to do this because we bring value. But can you just talk a little bit about how you launched the company and what vertical or what size company you went after and why? Absolutely. So with Staff Geek being a hiring assessment, right, almost the vast majority of companies have employees, so we can apply it almost anywhere. In particular, we looked at ways in which to break it down and who it would resonate with best. Number one, we set out by analyzing the, the competition, really the field, right? And I'm also speaking to my experience personally. Now I have some experience doing both blue collar work and white collar work. So I know personally some of the differences that go into who's a good fit for what environment relative to what you're doing. If you're doing like labor, contract work, mechanic work, versus if you're you're in a kind of have like an office job, if you will. So that was one of the first lines that we drew. We we dropped kind of the uh, trades, tradesmen crafts and work. Because number one, there's a, sea of mar there's a sea of products out there already that are pretty effective. And because there's less correlation amongst the things that we measure and success for those roles. Because a lot of them are very manually, manual labor intensive or physical. So for us, we're probably still going to introduce uh, a case study or a, a use case in that area at some point but that's going to be, that's more like horizontal expansion for us. So we first started with essentially the professional services. Then we started looking at, okay, 
Well, they, if we look at some of the metrics, like uh, my main canvas was up there a moment ago. Uh, let me try this. So if we go back to the lean canvas, box number eight, key metrics, how I'm calculating the ROI of using the product. For us, what we're looking to measure is are we increasing your retention and are we reducing your turnover? Right? If our product's working and it's the right fit, those are great metrics that are commonly that are commonly uh, scrutinized over in various organizations. And most HR professionals, those that are in recruiting, they know these numbers cold, they know the top of the head is what keeps them up at night. So for us, we're looking to make impact in these areas. So we reverse engineer from that. All right, how do we drill down further into the professional services kind of vertical, market vertical? Well, we looked at areas in which turnover, turnover is high and retention is low. We looked at things like uh, sales professional jobs. Those have uh, typically much higher turnover rate than a number of the other different types of professions and jobs. So we looked at areas where we can make potentially the biggest impact the most quickly, and where people would be looking to talk to us about what we're doing and have that motivating, motivating factor, right? Because if I ask someone to, right, lower level areas of retention are kind of like um, other different professional services, jobs like accounting and engineering and things like that, they're typically not at anywhere as high because their work is much more consistent. Business development sales is a kind of a wider spectrum and the work can be intense. Um, not everyone is, can be comfortable hearing nine no's or one yes or whatever their percentages are. So if we're talking to someone about what the product is and what it does, and we're saying we're going to make impact in areas of retention and turnover. If I'm talking to someone who is running an accounting firm versus I'm talking to someone who runs a sales department, I get two very different reactions. It's like, whoa, 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 you can reduce my turnover? Where do I sign up? Right, so that's another aspect that we use to kind of drill down even further. We look for these examples where we can make the biggest impact, where we can be the most uniquely differentiated, and then um, expand further from there, right? once we have the data that we